welcome all of you. The first session of this course starts with a lecture by Professor Srikantan. And uh, every day we would have an observer, a moderator, who would introduce the speakers and also who will be with you for the rest of the sessions. Uh, so let me introduce to you today's uh, moderator come observer for today's programs. She is uh, Dr. A.R. Vasavi. She has a PhD from Michigan State University, United States of America. She is a senior fellow at School of Social Sciences. She has a doctorate in social anthropology. Her academic interests are in social anthropology of India, agrarian studies, and sociology of education. She has taught at Tufts University in the Institute of Management, Calicut, and at several other institutions in India. She has conducted field research in various parts of India and has published a book, Harbingers of Rain, Land and Life in South India. Dr. Vasavi. A pleasure to introduce one of our most senior colleagues, uh, Professor B.V. Shrinkantan, who in fact we consider as one of the founding members of this institution since he has been with Dr. Ramana ever since its inception. Professor Srikantan is, uh, is pro currently visiting professor at NIAS. He's also the chairman of the Gandhi Center of Science and Human Values of the Bhavan, Bangalore. And he's an editorial fellow of the Project of History of Indian Science, Philosophy, and Culture. Uh, he was formerly mm, the director of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research during 75 to 87, and the Indian National Science Academy, Srinivasa Ramanujan professor during 87-92. He has specialized in cosmic rays, high energy physics, and high energy astro astronomics, and has published over 200 research papers. His current interests are in philosophy of science and scientific and philosophical studies on consciousness. He is fellow of the Indian Academy of Science, the Indian National Academy, and the National Academy of Sciences. He has received a number of professional awards, including the R.D. Birla Award of the Indian Physics Association. He has held a number of visiting positions, including yeah, both in the US and in Japan. He has been a recipient of the Padma Bhushan Award. In many ways, uh, Professor Srikantan's work, especially in consciousness, and of course with his background in cosmology, has been uh, some, in some ways uh, foundational in ge generating or giving us a framework for better interdisciplinary <coughs> studies at NIAS. And today, of course, he'll be speaking on the ever-ascending uh, science technology spiral. Thank you, Professor Srikantan. Today, uh, I want to talk on a very favorite subject of mine, which is uh, science technology spiral. When I first wrote just science technology spiral, my son said, you see, he's a mathematician, he said the spiral has got two ends, it could be descending spiral or it could be an ascending spiral. So then I thought that I should put uh, the more appropriate one, the ever ascending science technology spiral. Now I'll uh, talk for about 45 to 50 minutes and um, what I'm going to do is follow Rui Carol's uh, famous statement, when shall I begin, please your majesty, he asked, begin at the beginning and go on till the end and then stop. So I'll go on till the end until you stop me either in the middle or the moderator stops me somewhere. Well, more than uh, 60 years ago, you know, one of the most famous uh, scientific writers at that time was uh, Sir James Jeans. You must have read many of his books. And those of you who are electrical engineers know his name also as the author of a book on electrical engineering. And also, uh, those of you who are familiar with physics uh, know about the famous uh, Raleigh Jeans uh, law, which really was responsible for uh, setting off, in a way, quantum mechanics. He writes in his uh, book, Growth of uh, Physical Science, we look upon helpless while our material civilization carries us at uh, breakneck speed to an end which no man can foresee or even conjecture. And the speed forever increases. The last hundred years have seen more change 
than a thousand years of Roman Empire, more than a hundred thousand years of Stone Age. This change has resulted in large part from the applications of physical sciences, which through the use of steam, electricity, and gasoline, and by way of, by way of various industrial arts, now affect almost every moment of our existence. You know, this was written before the last World War, before 1940s, till late 1930s. And uh, at that time, science was still, you know, we were only talking about uh, just a little bit of electronics, but otherwise, you were still in the age of electricity, steam engine, and uh, things like that. But what has happened in the last uh, 50, 60 years is something very different, which he could not have envisaged himself. But as uh, Louis Carroll has said, I'm going to start at the beginning. In the first 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to give an introduction of how technology came into existence, what was called craft for a long time, before even science. Now, the beginning, of course, according to our current ideas of how the universe started, is about uh, actually 13.6 billion years, according to the current ideas. And uh, 1 billion is about uh, 1,000 million, as you know. Then, of course, you talk about the evolution of the universe and the solar system and Earth. Earth is about 4.7 billion years, half the time. And uh, then on the Earth, you have the formation of the Earth first, then chemical and biological evolution. And about 200 million years ago, we stepped in as humankind. Our ancestors of man appeared on the Earth about 2 million years ago. And uh, what happened initially was the primary requirements were food, water, <coughs> and shelter. <coughs> Simple tools of stones, bones for cutting, meat and shredding plants. This was the kind of uh, scenario in which we started growing. Then, of course, came fire for warmth and uh, scaring wild animals, and later for cooking. Then, of course, the erect human beings started coming up, the Homo sapiens, with uh, some more advances in technology, or you might say, uh, craft, spearheads, harpoons, hand yakes for hunting, fishing, and so on. Then the period 10,000 to 2,500 BC is the period of Neolithic Revolution. Man moves from gathering food to producing food, and then started rudiments of agriculture, domestication of animals and plants, fruits and flowers. Then came the wheel potteries for cooking, animal drawn wheeled vehicles for mobility. By 6000 BC itself, we had uh, some metals, copper, bronze, iron for implements, and the rare metals like gold and silver for ornaments. Then interesting developments start. As I said, 6500 years, the potter's wheel. You should uh, see the red ones essentially because you will realize one very interesting aspect. I would like to ask you what it is at the end of my lecture. Asia Minor, 3300 BC wheel, Sumerians, 2900 BC the pyramid Gizi in uh, Egypt, then 2500 BC the ship, uh, Egyptians again Phoenicians, 1500 BC lath by Greeks, 200 BC again liver and pulley Greeks, you know, the famous Archimedes was responsible for these developments. The six, then we jump, 600 AD, the windmill, and then of course use of iron. 700 porcelain in China. 725 mechanical clock, 800 compass. Compass was actually uh, first discovered in Iran. And 800 BC is gunpowder in China. 1285 spectacles in Italy, 1454 printing machine again in China, 1455 metal types of printing in Germany, Gutenberg, 1500 is. Then comes the beginnings of uh, you know the scientific instruments like the telescope, 
the mercury barometer and the pendulum clock. These, you know, are really the first instruments that uh, man was able to develop which started us thinking in terms of science, measurement in terms of uh, classifying things according to sizes, weights and things like that. And then finding out some ideas of temperature, warmth. Just till then, it was all very, very quantitative science. But with the advent of the barometer, with the, uh, uh, the thermometer, okay. then comes steam engine, then steam driven car, the spinning journey, and a flush toilet. The flush toilet is an important development because all this civilization that we see would not have been possible but for this development because you would not have had skyscrapers and things like that. Quite a lot of things came up because of these developments. Then gas lighting, cotton gin, and telegraph. Telegraph also is fairly old. Then comes a series of important developments in our current way of living. Uh, steam locomotive, steam ship, arc lamp, gyroscope, spectroscope. Analog computer in USA, one of our Bush, 1930. Then, of course, come some other important scientific instruments like the radio telescope, 1933 electron microscope, 1935 nylon. In 1937, Xerox, 1939 jet plane, then comes 1945 the digital computer. You know, whatever happened after this and just before this is all due to the Second World War in Paris. See, the Second World War, though uh, was responsible for a lot of Holocaust and a lot of killing, etc., you must also recognize that uh, it was the period before that and immediately after that that all sophisticated technologies developed including uh, the important development of radar. In 1957, the first lasers were made. 1971, the microcomputer. So if you look at all the developments that I've shown so far, 3000 BC to 1600 AD, a very long period, went about in things like uh, potter's wheel, wheel carriage, and so on, until we come to watch and uh, microscope. In 1600 to 1880, telescope, mercury barometer, pendulum clock, steam engine, and so on. 1800 to 1900 AD, which is the 19th century, steam locomotive, steamship, arc lamp, and then this, of course, is the period when people started moving out to other countries and so on. And then the conquest also became more. And in the last 100 years, 1890 to 1990, there has been a close coupling between developments in physical sciences and major technological developments. In fact, this is what I really want to emphasize in this talk. With this background, you see that uh, there is a certain amount of development that took place by itself, not so much dependent on developments in science. Technology developed in parallel to some crude ideas in science at that time. But what has happened since the beginning of 20th century is something very different. Science and technology are always together. As science advanced, you see, it became possible to, for example, you take electronics. It is with the discovery of the electron that all the subsequent developments in electronics took place and uh, all the developments by way of communications developed. There's a very close coupling between what is happening in the field of science and what is happening in the field of technology. See, the electromagnetic waves, Maxwell wrote down his equations, uh, so-called fam famous Maxwell's equations, in the, around 1850 or so. But then, after the discovery and production of uh, electromagnetic waves in the laboratory by Hertz, and also by Jagdish Chandra Bose in India, you see, it assumed an entirely different importance. The electromagnetic wave became the tool of everything, the communications, radio communications, and then variety of types of detectors, and so many things happened because of the electromagnetic wave uh, production and detection and so on. Radios, TV, radar, all come in, the, in that classification. Then there were some chance discoveries. You know, in the, uh, the way science progresses, two ways. One is you look for something very specific. But more often, what happens in science is 
what we call serendipity. Serendipity is a name which comes from, uh, uh, at least according to some people, comes from the word Simhaladvip. Why is it called Simhaladvip? Because three fishermen are supposed to have gone from Sri Lanka in the old days. Simhaladvip became Serendipity. And Simhaladvip is Sri Lanka, Siloam. And uh, their three fish fishermen went out. And then they were not, they, they went out to get the normal fish they were used to. But they got entirely different type of fish. Totally unexpected discovery of a new variety of fish they got. Since then, a discovery that is made, which was not planned for, but which you come across suddenly, they are called serendipitous. Now, radioactivity is one such discovery. Another discovery was x-rays. All that they were trying to do was to study discharge tubes. And they, in the case of uh, discovery of radioactivity, you know, Henry Becquerel had kept a piece of pitch blend, one of the mat uh, materials, in uh, a drawer. And by the side was kept a packet of photographic plates. When he tried to use the photographic plates, he found the plates were completely Plates were very well protected with uh, black uh, paper and all that. Still, they were completely fogged. Then that led to the discovery of radioactivity, that there are certain substances from which spontaneously charged particles, neutral particles are coming out. Leakage of uh, some particles from what were believed to be uh, atoms and nuclei at that time, which are considered to be exceedingly stable. Nothing can happen to them, but it was found here that they were giving out particles. Then, of course, the uh, x-rays were also discovered. You know, the discharge tube was there. And then, by the side, again, there was a batch of photographic plates kept in a dark uh, uh, paper, covered with dark paper. And uh, Ranjan found that uh, these plates also had been exposed. And that is how we discovered x-rays. But you know the consequences of x-ray machines, which have Today dominate the whole field of uh, diagnostics and uh, in the field of uh, medicines. It is being used for uh, certain types of diseases and also as diagnostic tool and in so many applications of x-rays I don't have to tell you now. Then around the same period some fundamental facts about the way the universe behaves, the way matter behaves, the way things happen started coming in. As I told you, this black body radiation spectrum discrepancies with that led to a new field of uh, uh, physics, which you call quantum mechanics, quantum physics. And then it also happened, you know, till then, for a very long time, we thought if you have two objects coming towards each other, their velocity should add. But somehow, in an experiment that was done by Michelson and Morley, it was shown that uh, you just can't add anything to the velocity of light. Velocity of light uh, remains constant. With whatever speed you go, the velocity, the, uh, or in the opposite direction, if the light is coming, it comes with the same velocity. The addition of velocities was a very important concept in science that had to be given up. Later on, it was shown that all that happens if you are moving towards it is it frequency changes. Instead of uh, you can move from red to green if you move fast enough. So that's the kind of, uh, it was a big surprise because it was a challenge how to account for the failure of the fact that the velocities are not adding up. It goes against common sense. And that is what led in a way to the theory of relativity and then uh, I don't want to go into the ramification of that, just to tell you that, that the ideas in relativity were responsible for the famous equation E equals mc squared. And E equals mc squared was again responsible for the whole of the atomic energy program. See, it is crucial to realize that energy and mass are one and the same. And you can get out of mass a lot of energy. That relation, that relation E equals mc squared connects the amount of uh, energy you can get out of a certain amount of mass. And that was a very crucial discovery that came out of a theoretical interpretation of what was happening to explain many other phenomena by Einstein. Of course, this year, as you know, we are celebrating a 12005 is the 100th year of the famous papers published by 
Einstein. And that is why 2005 was considered as the 100th year, the whole of, uh, it is called the year of physics, 2005, 2006, because three of the most important papers of Einstein were published in 1905. Then comes uh, the uh, a photoelectric effect in which, you see, if light falls on certain substances, it gives out electrons. This is a famous photoelectric effect. It has got wide applications, again. And uh, the wide applications come uh, not only in one field, but you can take the medical field, you can take any detector that you see today is based upon the fact that this uh, light effect giving rise to the emission of uh, particles. Then it goes on like that. Then suddenly something very interesting happened and that is uh, discovery of cosmic rays in 1912 which led to the discovery of a host of new particles. In the laboratory one had seen certain types of particles, uh, protons, electrons, neutrons and so on, which were the constituents of nuclei and all that. But suddenly experiments revealed, to our surprise, lot of new types of particles. This opened up the whole field of elementary particle physics, which we were not aware of at all. Actually, we thought that the universe consists of first matter and radiation, and matter, when it was analyzed, we uh, started breaking them into compounds and then elements, and then from there we went on to molecules and atoms. We thought that's the end of the whole sequence of uh, smaller and smaller things. But finally, we realized that that is not the end. You see, the end goes on and uh, you see, we, we, then we discovered that the proton, which is the most important uh, constituent of the nucleus, and the neutron, which is the other constituent of the nucleus, are themselves made of other particles. And uh, so the a whole field of microcosmos started. But there, by then, when uh, certain indications came from cosmic ray experiments, it became possible because of, again, technological developments, particularly in the field of vacuum technology, and then high voltage generation, and then uh, uh, electromagnetic waves of very high frequency and very high power. These are the technological developments that were necessary to make higher and higher energy accelerators. Accelerators were responsible for, again, enhancing the whole field of fundamental particle uh, physics because there, instead of just one or two or ten elementary particles, it turned out there are hundreds of them and all different types of properties. Normally, we don't see them anywhere in the, either in the laboratory or in the universe. To f really look at them, you need very special type of uh, detectors called particle detectors and you have got to have electronics which is uh, which can respond to exceedingly short intervals of time. Very specially designed type of electronics is necessary. So on the one hand, that gave impetus to what we today very normally use as pulsed electronics. The, the motivation for pulsed electronics came from the need for measuring time intervals of shorter and shorter duration, which was a very important thing. And uh, pulse electronics has played an exceedingly important role in the field of radar and in the field of later on in many other applications also. So you can see the coupling between developments in science and technology, the motivation from one coming to the other. Then of course, you know, the accelerators also needed uh, low temperatures and then superconducting magnets became also a necessity for accelerating particles because you needed electric fields and magnetic fields and to get high energy, high intensity magnetic fields it was found the most efficient way and most cost effective in terms of power was uh, superconducting magnet. So superconductivity developed though it was first discovered that as you go to lower and lower temperatures that uh, certain materials become superconducting. They can, the resistance totally disappears. That is the phenomenon of superconductivity. And that was again used both in industry and also in the laboratories for producing higher and higher energy magnetic fields because magnetic fields became a very important tool in the hands of industry and for many other applications. And then of course came the transistor and from the transistor, you know the whole development of electronics, the VLSI, and then came the whole chip concept. And today, we have 
all the developments in electronics uh, coming from the first discovery of electron and then discovery of uh, the particular materials, the materials that could give rise to the transistor effect and so on. So material sciences became extremely important. On, on that side, you can see that um, I have already talked about particle accelerators, refrigeration, computers came. See, with the development of electronics, another exceedingly important field was computers. And computers, again, were first made for the laboratory. They were not meant for uh, the type of applications that is we are seeing today. But first, they were used for uh, uh, online control of uh, many experimental settings and analysis of experimental data and so on. You see, when you go to high energy accelerators, you find that when particles collide, so many types of secondary radiations are produced to, and of various, uh, you know, particles which are having very different lifetimes. Because the, we are now living in a, an atmosphere where things don't last for even a second, they are 10 to the power of minus 10, minus 11, minus 23 seconds. So you have to capture what is happening in those time intervals, exceedingly short time intervals. For that purpose, the only way you can do it is to, con and you naturally you will have a lot of junk in the background. So you have to eliminate the background and then select things that are really of interest to you. And it is in that connection that the whole field of uh, developments in computer technology, this whole question of parallel processing, and all these things developed, and which today are finding applications in a variety of different ways. Then, of course, as technology developed, rock balloons, rockets, and satellites came into picture. Now, with balloons, you know, as I mentioned, we. Uh, used balloons for a variety of experiments in the field of cosmic rays because you have to get out of uh, the Earth's atmosphere to record the particles that are coming from outside. And uh, then, of course, with the rockets which uh, and satellites, the possibility of having an entirely new type of uh, vision about the universe came into existence. I'm going to talk a little more about that a little later. Then in 20th century, because of all these developments, entirely new disciplines emerged, which were not at all important in the old days. In fact, even in 1950s, it's 1950s is probably turning point when all these new fields came into the picture. Before that, you know, when we were students actually, the fields were uh, properties of matter, electricity, magnetism, and optics to some extent. And, uh, Maybe something in modern physics like nuclear physics was just coming in. But what happened after that in the last 50, 60 years is entirely new fields have come in the, in the field of science. That is solid state physics, solid state electronics, material sciences, biophysics, molecular biology, neurobiology, space physics, space astronomy, and radio astronomy, and now the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Then, of course, uh, chaos is a new discipline in uh, uh, analysis of uh, phenomena and artificial intelligence, computer science, and so on. This is uh, all consequences of, because of technological developments on the one hand. Now, what these developments did, technological developments did, I'll spend a little time on that because it's important. You see, this led to things like cement, steel, water, uh, taps, gas lighting, electrical lights, and things. And then came factories for production of goods in and around cities. How the whole uh, lifestyles changed as science and technology developed. Then came telegraphs, telephones, fast, faster modes of communication. Then all this uh, typewriter, printing press, books, magazines, etc. Then civil amenities like hospitals, schools, colleges, etc. Part of pastoral agricultural society got transformed to industrial society. Worldwide movements of goods by ships and locomotives, colonization of distant lands, concentration of power, wealth, and resources in the hands of a few countries. This is all the fallout of uh, science and technological developments. And uh, you see what was happening you know, hundreds of years took now much shorter period. Then this led to the megapolis uh, things, and then the transportation 
uh, with uh, buses, trains, aeroplanes, intercontinental services and things like that. Then food became mechanized agriculture, tractors, implements, fertilizers, refrigerators, etc. Then came communication satellites, telegraph, telephone, telex, email, etc. Health eradication of epidemics, well equipped hospitals, drugs, antibiotics. These are all good part of the development of uh, technology because basic, basically all these developments took place on the one hand. See, whatever happened in the area of physical sciences helped the medical sciences in developing most of these diagnostic tools and also in. Um, then, of course, this is also well known entertainment industry, radio, TV, VCR, etc. Then came the security aspects, fallouts, atom bomb, hydrogen bomb, neutron bomb, fighters, spy satellites, and so on. Industrial production of modern factories, fully automated computer control production, and so on. Then weather prediction, remote sensing, etc. Then, of course, uh, we're talking a little about space astronomy, its importance. It's important to emphasize that all these goodies of technology are really only in a small fraction of the world. The affluent nations, the LGDs alone. So this is how it created the sociological imbalances and problem, carbon dioxide, chlorine, and so on. Contamination of water, large number of vehicles on the roads. These problems you are familiar with. The, you have to trace all this. For us who have lived in Bangalore 50, 60 years ago, and who are now living here, you can see that uh, has science and technology improved our lot or has made it worse? We feel that, uh, you know, we feel bad about the whole thing because it, the same thing could have been utilized properly for a better Bangalore, but it is not so. It has become worse. Sixty percent of world resources are governed by USA, one single country. And then if all the food output of the world is distributed, even among all the nations, there will be no starvations anywhere. But there is no such thing happening. Again, I, there is a list of series of negative aspects of the whole thing, uh, which uh, I have emphasized enough. Then, of course, you know you all know about the problems created by the radiation fallout, lack of reliable information, secrecy about these are all responsible for the problems of the world today. Then you have uh, the problem of pollution. Global environmental change, which has become a very major concern today, and I'm sure somebody will talk to you about those problems. Then what has happened now is, in the old days, the cities would be planned according to your requirements. But today you have to worry more about how the ecological constraints are there before you think in terms of... Uh... But for how long all this will go on? Even if the danger of a nuclear holocaust recedes with better counsel prevailing on the superpowers, the other danger due to global environmental change is real and has to be tackled if a fish, and this is a very beautiful example given, if a fish is put in a vessel of boiling water, it jumps out. If on the other hand it is put in cold water which is gradually heated, that is what is happening to all of us in the cities then it dies. Multidimensional problems involving governments, industrialists, and etc. Now I come to the real advances in the frontiers of science that has come about because of uh, science, because of developments in technology, which again have been fed in the earlier years by science. Now I can't really go into all the advances that have taken place. I will take a few specific examples and show how technological advances have led to what kind of advances in the fundamental areas. Because you will be surprised at the kind, this kind of this kind of advance would not have happened at all in the old days, if but for the power of uh, technology. Uh, I, I have already talked about how cosmic ray investigations led us to the discovery of certain types of new particles. It it uh, led us to the uh, whole exposure to what we call the microcosmos. 
which is micro in the sense that you cannot see with your eye, you cannot see with your, you cannot feel them with your senses, but you can uh, barely see them with microscopes, but not even see them, but you can infer that something is there. But then there are now technologies will take you to deeper and deeper into the field of microcosmos. The same thing has happened with respect to the macrocosmos, which is more exciting, which is very important because we think that we are important living on the earth. We are fighting with each other, we are doing so many things uh, because of our self-interest, selfish motives and things like that. But really, when you get a picture of what we are in the whole cosmos, then you realize that we are absolutely insignificant. If only that realization comes to us, our whole attitude changes. You see, we are part of one solar system, the part of the sun and the planets around it. We are on the earth. And then this, there are something like a hundred million suns. That constitutes one galaxy. And there are 200 million such galaxies in the universe. All this we have, it's not just conjecture, maybe about 100 years ago or 200 years ago one would have said this is all just your imagination. But today it is not so. These have all been seen and recorded. Their properties we know, their distances we know, what they are constituted of we are known. So we have to face the realities. Now this um, astronomy, again this is a reflection on technology. The information is coming to us. Not to, see, we think astronomy means optical telescopes. You go and uh, sit behind an optical telescope and look. It is not so. It was so till about 1930 or so. Then we started realizing that uh, these objects are not only sending us light waves, which we are seeing as twinkling stars or planets and so on, but they are sending out varieties of radiations. And one of the important radiation was radio waves. So with the development of technology, it became possible to record the radio waves and look at the field of uh, what is happening in these objects in terms of radio. And that's the field that gave rise to uh, radio astronomy. Radio astronomy was actually started before the last world war. But after the world war, with the development of uh, new technologies, it has become a very thriving field, one of the most important fields of uh, investigation today because it has made us understand that there are objects which are very different from what we can even imagine, basically. There are objects where if you just if I have a ring of uh, this thing, it will weigh something like 2,000 tons of material. The material there, if I just make a ring of this size, will weigh 2,000 tons. That means matter is compacted to such a great extent in some objects called neutron stars and in black holes and so on, that uh, uh, one ring will weigh as much as 2,000 tons. So that's the compression that is possible, that is taking place in some of these objects and neutron stars. Similarly, in black holes, it can be even higher. This uh, I have already talked about varieties of particles. Now, this is one of the pictures that is normally given with an optical telescope. You know, even in optical telescopes, in the old days, we used to sit uh, uh, at a mountain altitude or at sea level and then look at the thing. But today it has been possible, thanks to development in space technology, to put a telescope in orbit. And uh, one of the most famous telescopes is called the Hubble telescope. And the Hubble telescope has given us a lot of new information because the atmosphere of the Earth, you see, um, is responsible for firstly absorption of light, it reduces the intensity of light that we see, and secondly it scatters the light and so on. So putting a telescope in space makes a big difference. Now all kinds of new data has come out of it, both from uh, instruments which are on the surface, on the ground, and also those that have been sent up. Now when you look at a picture like this, this is a typical uh, Hubble telescope picture, you see as if you have a horse head. But actually that horse head is nothing other than dark matter, you see, which is just shielding the light from the various stellar objects far behind. Now, um, 
There are a variety of um, objects have been discovered like that. This, for example, gives you each one of the uh, things here is a galaxy by itself. And this galaxy contains, for example, this or this or this, 200 billion stars. 200 billion, 2 to the power of 11 stars are there in one galaxy. And like that the universe is made. And then what is the distance between one and another? You know that the farthest uh, objects from us are something like uh, 10 billion years, 10 billion light years. What is a light year? Light year is the time that light takes to travel in one second, which is 186,000 in one year. And light travels at the rate of 186,000 miles per second. Fantastic distances. You can't imagine. Uh, your imagination fails because uh, you can talk about the sun eight minutes distance. You can talk about the moon about uh, half a second distance. But when you talk about uh, these galaxies, you are talking in terms of millions of light years to billions of light years. No. That means these objects have been formed that time uh, backwards, basically. Otherwise, it's quite possible that light from some of them we are not seeing because they have come and gone, and some some others which are still farther off are coming in later. Now, this is a kind of galaxy which is known as the Andromeda galaxy, which shows this is similar to what our galaxy is. You see, if you go in the night in Bangalore or in any place, you see a bright patch of light in the in the sky, and that's called the Milky Way. And uh, this is, if you look at John, that is how this also will look. So we are part of a galaxy like that. Now, this is another interesting picture. You know, it's called the ant galaxy. It looks like an ant which is going in the sky, basically. And this is actually a nebula which is just expanding. But what is not known, it is still an open question, what is it that is expanding and what is the reason for it to expand? It's a cold object out of which some gas is coming out. And why should there be such a high symmetry? You can see it's as if something from the center, whether you go in this direction or in this, go, it's so symmetrical as if you can put a mirror and say this is the direction. So there are these peculiarities in the sky which we still have to understand. Now again, you know, there are all kinds of objects in the sky. There are some, as I told you, which you call neutron stars, or some which are called white dwarfs, some are called black holes. Uh, from molecules and atoms, you find very huge objects in the sky. The size, and some of these have lost it for billions of years, as we can see. Now, this is the picture that we have constructed out of all the physics that is now available about particle production, about uh, and all the astronomical results that we have. We have very good reason to believe that the universe, as we call it, was created some 13.6 billion years ago in a big explosion. What exploded? I can't answer that question. Because there was no before that according to this idea. Time, space, matter, everything started with that explosion, which happened 36 point billion years ago. Immediately after that explosion, the temperature was so high that one started cooking up in that place various types of particles. And, uh, and then the particles started ag aggregating because of gravitational force because even the concept of force and things like that were not there before. But you have to introduce these ideas also with the um, first explosion. That means you have to be given certain basic things to be able to even scientifically explain today whatever we see. The, the creation of space, the creation of time, the creation of particles, and then the creation of various types of forces, etc. We know what they are, but we don't know how they were created because the space has to have certain very special properties to be able to be created like that. We can only say that space must have these properties. But if you ask the question, how did that space come into being, we have no answer still. And that is one of the uh, 
mysteries of science till today. That, of course, in all fields, you can go up to a point and then beyond that you should not question. Otherwise, you cannot proceed at all. Yeah, particularly when you go backwards, you will not know beyond a certain time, beyond a certain distance, basically. So, according to this picture, there is, you, see, you can see man sitting here, and uh, that is how he has come after so much of time. As I gave you the time period, some... Uh, then, you see, the various stages at which particles were created, atoms were made, and then uh, the various galaxies were formed, etc. The beauty is that with all the developments in science, it has been possible to construct a whole sequence of events. What happened when and uh, how it happened, that is possible to say. But the basic uh, question as to how space got these properties to create, that we still don't know. And I don't know whether we'll ever know. Now, more recently what has happened is that uh, all this things that I showed, what I call the universe, with all these stars, galaxies, and uh, etc., is only 4%, if current ideas are correct, of all the, of the universe. We are basing all our conclusions only on 4% of matter that is made available to us. The 96% is in a forum. We know if our science has to be consistent, if, our, if we have to find an explanation for all that is there, you see, the remaining 96%, we don't know their characteristic. So we have a big mystery sitting there. All our present uh, ideas of uh, science, when I talk about that, all our ideas of particles, the forces, and things like that, on which all our developments in technology are based and so on, is based upon just 4% of the total material that is available. The remaining 96% is in a forum. We know it has to be there to be consistent with our theories, but we don't know what it is. And there are concepts like dark matter. That's why people have called them dark matter, dark energy. Now the question is, will the future science, will the future technology enable us to identify what this 96% is. We know it exists, because if it doesn't exist, then many of our ideas of gravitation, many of our ideas of uh, forces, etc., fail. But what it is, in what form it is, we just don't know. So the future remains, in a sense, uh, very wide open. This provides for, again, very large scope for new technological developments. We don't know in how it will come. We never thought that uh, technology will lead us one day to the discovery of what we call the three degree microwave radiation, which is something that happened and that has cooled down to the current temperature of three degrees. When the universe expanded and started expanding, the entire universe is filled with this radiation. We never thought we will be able to discover that, but technology helped us to discover it. Of so like that, many things have happened. So the current situation is, this is something that is happening in the last four or five years, is that all our knowledge in the area of uh, physical and astronomical sciences is based upon matter and radiation it constitutes only 4% of what really exists there. The other 96%, we don't know what it is. But one interesting thing is that even with all these limitations, one thing that we have been able to establish very well is, which is very important, is where all the materials that we are familiar with have been cooked. You can ask the question, where did the carbon or the iron in my blood or calcium in my bones, where did they come from? You will straight away say it came from the earth. Where did the earth get it from? All these metals, all these precious things, uranium too, all the things we have on the earth. Where did they come from? How were they cooked? We have answers for that. They have come from the rest of the universe. But how were these heavy elements? See, first, 
from the particles you could cook hydrogen cook, you could cook hydrogen and uh, maybe some light elements but all the others interestingly all the others got cooked when stars exploded what are called supernova explosions when stars explode you see you have very high temperatures created around them when you have very high temperatures and you have all these some hydrogen and helium some materials around them they start forming by nuclear processes the other elements so the interesting result is that each one of us is part of the universe as a whole our see if you take one atom of my blood iron atom in my blood must have come from one explosion somewhere that took place some million years ago or two million years ago another atom must have come from another star which exploded somewhere else in another time so it is really each one of us is made of things which have come at very different times in their explosion at uh, from very different stars in that sense we are part of the universe uh, philosophically it's a very interesting idea that each one of us is connected somewhere or the other both in space and time with all the rest of the universe and that is what this says that where actually what kind of elements are cooked what happened in the early universe what happened in stars what happens when stellar explosions and so on now i just uh, don't want to uh, say too much about this one other area which has come into great importance is nanotechnology this again we are dealing with a region of uh, uh, size which is uh, not the region of fundamental particles it is not the region of uh, large size grains etc something of the order of intermediate size which we call nanoparticles and now this has become a very important uh, new development that is taking place which is again creating a lot of uh, interest essentially because it is leading to the capability for producing entirely new type of materials which of course we are interested if you are in the service of man so you have got uh, a variety of things happening here and here again some exceedingly interesting technological developments like the scanning electron microscope the uh, afm and so on these have become exceedingly uh, relevant and important and uh, you find a variety of um, uh, interesting thing is this you find again you know a substance which is a conductor one of these nano materials in a straight section is a conductor you make it into a coil it becomes an insulator now this is a very fun fantastic originally we thought there is a relation between conductivity and uh, something inside but this is showing the nano materials are showing something very different that the same material if it is a straight line it will be a conductor if it is spirally wound it becomes uh, an insulator and so on and they, these have very wide applications as you can see to us and uh, and nanotechnology has become and it's so important that usa is spending something like 3.7 billion uh, dollars between 2005 that's the projection and then europe 125 million per year uk 8.81.9 million million per year pound uh, do dollars india is spending negligible so this brings me to the question that if you really want to advance in these areas if you really want to become yesterday we heard we were exciting talk by uh, dr kiran majumdar see what we are spending is uh, absolutely trivial let me tell you. the money that we are spending on uh, research and development of technology is absolutely trivial commercially it may look but here again it is not our development we are just copying from somewhere and doing something if you want to do really original work if you really want to get somewhere you have to invest heavily for example the success in space sciences and space technology has because a reasonable amount of money has spent has been spent has been invested in those technologies over the last 20 years so the lesson that we have to learn from the way science and technology have supported each other is we cannot expect anything to happen unless we are prepared to make very large scale investment investment in terms of manpower in terms investment in terms of money 
And at the moment, though there is uh, at least some hope that there is a change of heart in the government circles and there is increasing money coming in, still it is nowhere compared to what is being done by other countries. I mean, uh, it's all right. We can do good mathematics probably with some uh, amount of math, not so much money. We can do some amount of theoretical work. But when it comes to a question of really what uh, matters from the point of view of uh, technology development, we have to be spending much larger than uh, what we are planning. So to conclude, I quote from Abraham Lincoln, if we know where we are and where we are going, we can better understand what we must do. When Franklin Long says, society I submit is rapidly modifying the objectives it holds for science. It wants help in its technology. It urgently needs help in solving problems of peace, poverty, pollution, and population. Scientists cannot fail to respond, and the response will involve much more social commitment by scientists and greatly intensified participation of scientists in problem-oriented interdisciplinary efforts. Thank you. <coughs>
United States made something like 60,000 atom bombs and hydrogen bombs. And uh, in parallel, Soviet Union made uh, maybe 50,000 atom bombs. It's, it has not been possible to control that way. One, because it is not entirely in the hands of the scientists alone. Because uh, they, then once the potential is realized, it goes into the hands of the administrators and into the hands of the military and uh, of course of the governments and so on. So that is the danger. I, mean, uh, kind of, uh, I just wanted to highlight that uh, science also is a double-edged weapon. I mean, uh, you develop science, but the same thing is happening now with uh, biotechnology. See, we know some of the benefits of biotechnology, but we, we have to realize that there can be equally bad effects. We know the whole field of... Uh, no, no, that's a well-debated topic, sir, but what I just uh, want is, is there any way that collectively through UN forum or forum or any other forum, this can be regulated. See, the this is basically a, out of ego. See, or that I am greater a, than you. Pagwash was a movement in that direction. I don't think it has helped very much to do it. It's, uh, because it's no longer, see, once power is developed, you become more powerful, you don't listen to reason. That is the problem. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr. for the quick narration of all the inventions. My question is, during the 19th and 20th century, most of the major inventions are only from the European continent. Why is it so? Any analysis has been done? Uh, European what? The, all the inventions, major inventions are from the European continent only. Why is it so? That is before, the, before. that's what I told you. What happened really was, Germany dominated in the number of Nobel Prizes till the war. If you look at all the Nobel Prizes, uh, in physics, and also some parts of Europe, medicine, all these were essentially from uh, Europe and Germany. But afterwards, after, 19, after the World War, America started putting money for uh, science and for medicine, for every, all developments. And they started getting people from all over. And if you look at the biographies of the Nobel laureates, you will find most of them have their origin in uh, Europe. My question is whether the other contents like the, the Asian or the African content, they were not thinking equally. I don't, I didn't understand your question. The, uh, probably because of the demand was more in the European content for the newer technology, that's why the things have started or the demand was not there in the other continents, no such inventions were taken place. See, demand and supply is one way of looking at the whole thing. But you know, that also is changing because anything that is developed in one country will find demand uh, all over the world today. It's not just uh, locally, uh, local demand that uh, really matters, basically. Most of these countries are also under colonial conditions. Uh, and of course, you know, politics has also dominated all these things. The control by, you see, now what is happening, uh, for example, India depends to a certain extent. You see, it has got probably the capacity to develop many things. But we are constrained because of other reasons, political reasons. Developments in, uh, uh, in any field. It's highly uh, politicized nowadays. You see. In fact, I didn't want to touch upon science and politics, but... Uh, uh, sir, Jayanth has already said about science-based technologies, its development. The problem that today we face is, you know, the technology, if it is not sustainable, particularly from environment viewpoint, has a, a certain or little acceptability in the field. The technologies that have come so far have not thought any way about the minimization of residues or generation of hazardous waste, or for example, that a cleaner technology, if I have to go into that. Now, the ascendancy that you have shown from science with the spiral that we have gone to a top where we can deliver the scientific benefits, the technological benefits to the society. At the same time, we find that we are also delivering to them certain hazards, which one he mentions about the global change and the climate change. We are talking on that because the energy has to be used, carbon dioxide has to be generated. But simultaneous utilization of carbon dioxide or sequestration or minimization of residue or optimization of product has not been thought 
was that it's because of that the planners have gone in for only one technology in mind and they had not taken the entire spectrum into consideration, keeping Mother Earth, our nature, as a recipient of its all residues. What is your opinion on this? You see, the typical example is uh, contamination by aerosols. See, kind of things that are given out by jet planes, basically. America has the technology to control that. They don't want to part with it. Refrigerator is the other thing. In fact, this point was brought out quite some time back that the developed countries which have the technology don't want to give it to the other countries. And it is only detrimental to them, basically, also. It's not that, uh, see, the, these problems are not going to remain. They are global. It's not that uh, if atmosphere is polluted, it may take another month or two to go to the United States if the pollution is taking place in India. It will just go there. There's no question about it. So the question, that is why a lot of time and effort is going on to make the uh, people aware of these problems, that to develop technologies that can mitigate these problems. One way, of course, is to reduce the, for example, you know what happened in Delhi by just changing over from uh, whatever was being used earlier, petrol and uh, kerosene for the uh, kerosene and uh, diesel for the auto rickshaws, when they changed over, uh, it became much better, isn't it? Control of pollution. So there are there are remedies like that for certain types of pollutants, but not all so far. No, a lot more research has to be done how to control the pollution. Nuclear reactors, for example, uh, so far, if you have succeeded in making uh, fusion reactors, the story would have been different. The contamination would be there, but not to the same extent. But that has not been feasible. Still. No, so there are limitations. Be, because we were doing one study for power projects based on coal, based on gas, based on water, hydroelectric power projects. Maybe the nuclear power also will come into picture. But the options that we have is, say for example, I have to shift from coal base to gas base. As you cited an example that CNG has generated, uh, remove at least the smoke formation or the carbon particles that were emitted. But if I have to shift from that, the major resource that I have today is coal and I must optimally use it. Yeah. I cannot import the coal. Then if I have to shift to gas, then I need to have the gas reserves or I need to transport gas from outside. I need to shift to water hydraulics then I need to get to the mother earth or need to the, get to the forests where I have to de deforest them. I don't have the space where I can have the hydroelectric powers erected. Coming to nuclear power, you rightly said that fusion reactors could have done better. Now on these options, when, I, when we look at Indian scenario, we still find that we, though we have a lot of scientific base, we have a lot of human resource, but somehow when it tries to marry the totality, we find that we don't have a decision to deliver that what could be the best option? Yeah. Now, this is where we find it because when I try to uh, monetize the environmental hazards or try to monetize the technological gains that we have, we still find that coal comes out to be a better option, though it is polluting. The only way that we can have is that residue to be utilized maximally, minimization of sulfur in the coal, generation of less sulfur dioxide. But still somewhere we are around hey, that It's a question of choosing one of the worst evils. You see, if you have got so many evils, sometimes you are forced to choose one of them because there is no other option, basically. That's what is happening in the power sector, isn't it? That uh, if uh, tomorrow uh, fusion does become feasible, then everybody will change. I mean, uh, the pollution problem will be much less, basically. So are wormholes possible? If so, what are, what are the implications of it? Well, that's a highly technical question. I don't know whether I can answer that myself because it is, uh, there is no evidence so far yet for wormholes. It's a concept still, basically, that we have evidence for, at least um, most people think that there is evidence for black holes, where all the matter is falling into the center. Uh, black hole, you know, is an object in which uh, the, all the matter is falling ultimately to the center. The theory is that this density which goes on increasing at the center of the black hole, it has to go somewhere. So the theory says that it must go and then come out somewhere else as a wormhole. I mean, from where we have no evidence for a, such a thing happening 
in our universe, not from some other universe to our universe. So wormhole is still a concept only. Kind of. yes. Sir, I have two questions. Uh, one is that uh, uh, being uh, in a technical stream, I find that, uh, at least that's my impression, your comment I would like on this, that today technology is moving at breakneck speed, true, but science doesn't seem to be keeping pace. And in lighter way, unless the science can uh, pick up speed, and we are not going to reach uh, and achieve con real systems uh, where which will allow like uh, things like teleportation. You see, the the discrepancy in the way science develops and technology develops, we should not compare it because technology there is a definite purpose for which you are doing something. Science is more an open-ended affair. See, in the case of science, what happens is that you are doing something and you come across some unexpected behavior or something, then you start pursuing that. Then you may find that has application somewhere else and you may, in science itself or in technology. So science is a very open-ended affair. And uh, not only that, you see, we have, to some extent, the science that we can do is limited by the technology we have. As I was telling you already, we have now technologies where you can measure times of 10 to the power of minus 15 seconds, what we call femtosecond technologies. But we still need for science to progress still shorter than that. There's a technological limitation which is coming in there to measure time intervals of uh, smaller than 10 to the power of minus 15 seconds or we can only see the effects of such things happening on the basis of certain other observations, but direct observations don't become... I'll give you a simple example like that. There are similarly a lot of limitations about... Uh, in any field, there are a lot of instrumental limitations. And the other thing that we realize in science is nature itself puts limitations. You see, you come to a stage where you cannot go beyond a certain... So when you reach that stage, you find that you cannot go further in the field of science. Of course, fortunately in technology we now reach those stages where there is a limit, basically. I don't think there is a limit to accepting material resources, financial resources, etc. There are limitations to building larger size reactors or larger size. There is no such a limit uh, in the case of technology. But in the case of science, uh, the science itself puts the way nature behaves Nature puts limitations on certain aspects. For yes. example, the standard example that is given is if you take a virus, you see, you can't, uh, virus, you can't multiply in a test tube. It only <coughs> multiplies in your body. No, but does uh, science place that, uh, nature place the limitation or does the, our We don't know the science? reason. You see, that has to be, that, that's the, it is the duty of science to find out why it is so. We have not been able to... You see, the whole point, there are limitations that are coming up in every field. You go up to a point and then you find this far and no further. I mean, with the present technology or with the present uh, concepts you have, or uh, you just uh, can't go beyond. No, but I'm, I want a sl slight clarification on your comment that uh, nature places limitations. It is what? actually our knowledge at that point of time which places a limitation. Yeah. Nature doesn't limit us. Huh? Nature doesn't limit Nature us. does limit. This is the beauty about it. We thought that there is no limit to nature. It is not so. We find this is one of the important lessons that we learned in physics. There are certain serious limitations in science. I mean, this has been recognized for 30, 40 years now. Limitations of science are there because of certain... Funda we don't know the reason for it, but there are fundamental constraints which are there in science. You just can't do anything about them. For example, the famous example that is given is uh, what is called the Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty where you can't with any instrument find the position of a particle and its momentum at the same time. So, so much so we don't even uh, know what you mean by position and what you mean by momentum at any instant of time. Because you can't measure both at the same instant of time to the any accuracy you want. You can only limit them, to, only in this region it is there, only in this time interval it is. There are certain limitations like that which are coming in, which are very fundamental and have a lot of consequences. We also benefit by such limitations. 
But then these are limitations of our knowledge. We don't know how to do that. No, that no. This, is, this is what I'm telling you. We thought that it's limitation of our knowledge. But ultimately, there are two, two ways of looking at these things. Either it is limitations of our knowledge or it is limitations imposed by nature itself. There are certain phenomena where you are able to see that it is not our limitation, but it is a limitation that is imposed by nature. For example, you know, you, I don't know that you have heard, you see in quantum mechanics you have this famous problem of whether a, it's a particle or a wave. Light, for example, is it a particle or a wave? You say, you should be able to settle it as an experiment. If you do one experiment, you see it as a particle. If you do other experiment, you see it as a wave. You can't do one experiment in which you establish both these characteristics. This is a limitation imposed on us. So reality and truth, you see, I don't want to become philosophical here, are very different, basically. Because that is where the limitation comes. I mean, I can't go on saying that, uh, like pe people used to say in the old days, oh, light has to be either wave or particle. But famous Niels Bohr said, you have to live with the fact that it can act, it can both be a particle and a wave. Which means, what does it mean? It means our normal ideas of logic fail. Now, sir, what our friend is telling has uh, some point because we can leave aside serendipity, okay, that is, uh, you know, no one can depend on that, but turning to pure physics, uh, I think our friend is a little correct in the sense, you see, in the, before 5th century BC, we have many brilliant Indians, uh, one name I could say is Kapil Muni, who has also been subsequently, you know, substantiated by Vivekananda. In so far as the human mind is there, you know, it is limitless. It is higher than the sky. I would refer to it as the elemental sky. There is also in a higher sky that we can call Chitta Kasa. But higher than that also, you know, is Chida Kasa. And human mind, you know, is perhaps possible, in the human mind it is possible to encompass everything. If I start from a very solid theoretical premise, if I start from multiplicity of theoretical premises and work on it in a logical method, it is not impossible for me, you know, to overtake even US or Europe because despite all their investments, their progress is pathetically slow. Today now it is possible for Stephen Hawking to come and say, no, something may also escape from the black hole. You know, you see, the point is the following. We are discussing here science and technology. So there, there are certain things which are accepted by science. We are not talking about knowledge and technology or knowledge and science. See, there may be alternative methods of uh, acquiring knowledge. I don't question that. Intuition, you see, you cannot scientifically argue how intuition comes and what happens, etc. And intuition may come to an absolutely unpunt person who has not studied anything or it may come to a brilliant mind. But what we are talking about is limitations of science. See, science has got certain uh, methodology and certain ways of accepting, and uh, that has been successful so far. We are only discussing here limitations to the scientific methodology and what you can derive from science. I'm not talking about the limitations that are there to knowledge per se. There may be other methods of acquiring knowledge which are totally different from science. That's a different issue altogether. Okay. I get this question in mind only because you cited the example of a particle <laughs> behaving, you know, at a particular time in a certain way. In fact, Kapil Muni in one specific place cites that if you divide a particle into two and separate them in very long distance, one would know what is being done by the other. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there are similar... See, yeah. but you see, we cannot, you see, Treat, bring them those considerations into science without examining their basis and uh, what they mean and what, uh, because in science we proceed on the basis of certain, uh, uh, you know, our concepts and th whether they conflict with our concepts. You cannot have a concept which conflicts with uh, what we use in some other context and so on. So, I'm not questioning 
that there could be other methods of knowing things, other methods of but what we are discussing here is what we accept as modern science and scientific methodology and uh, scientific and technology basically. In fact, uh, Time for only one more. Can I request Mr. Marjana to deliver the vote of thanks? Friends, I feel it is my privilege and honor to say what of thanks to a towering personality like Professor Srikantan. As I started my career, he was already director uh, TAFR, one of the known national and international R&D center of the country. So I am too small to make any mentions, but the lecture that he gave and the discussions that followed clearly shows that many of us, almost all of us are stimulated by the talk. He started with uh, the formation of universe, formation of galaxies, then took us to the formation of human beings, stone age, invention of wheel, probably it came up to invention of transistor, then the speed at which we have reaped the benefit of science and technology. And as he himself was mentioning the, the size or the quantum with which uh, the things are developing, the sizes are decreasing but benefits are increasing, the famous Moore's law. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank him on behalf of all the delegates here that the message you gave, the ideas you triggered us will carry us forward to think more and more and probably we will interact further amongst ourselves and with you sir. Thank you. I request uh, Sangeeta to please present a small token of our appreciation to Dr. Professor Shrikantan. Professor Shrikantan is part of NIAS, but still. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll be outside and uh, we reconvene at 4 o'clock. Yeah, thank you. Two o'clock, three. Thank you. Thank you. You need it, I understand you. <laughs> <laughs>